Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Hey, good afternoon. I'll go ahead and pin you. Hi. That's a quick question about password security. Is it yes. not, um, a good idea to start like a Google keychain, you know, like the automatic stored password? Or is that like still a safe option? It is safe as long as you don't lose it. Um, but anything you stored is not safe. So um, as we can actually retrieve a lot of the passwords and convert it into plain text. So I rarely ever use uh, save password in browser or any option. Now, if you work for a company that generate password on, um, you know, those USB token, then, you know, usually they use a one-time password. So it randomly generated. So if you use any product um, that is on a USB token, it's best if you look into that product, it ran, it should say randomly generated and it's a one-time use. Uh, because if they don't do that and if it's safe, like I don't even use pass, like the some of the things that comes with the mobile um, mm -hmm. to be able to save it. Because if you don't dispose the device properly, it, it would, um, somebody can retrieve it, so. Okay, that's really good to know. Yeah, because I have a like, laptop that is outdated, I've already moved to a new one and I need to like wipe that one. And that made me think about the Google. I've also yeah. been trying to change all my passwords to past phrases and seeing it's kind of impossible to remember if I don't like physically write it down or something. Right, and Google lately, they've been having issues with password leak. Yes. So is Apple. So you have to frequently change your password if you're using password. I, um, I recommend yeah, like two days ago, it was like 28 different sites that I have accounts with all about. Right. Leaving, so so I, I, I recommend using biometrics. Um, mm -hmm. Our biometric systems are much better now. So you should, if you're using a password, you should parallel it with fingerprint or um, some form of facial recognition. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, hi everybody. It's the third week of class. So sorry about my dog, it's ball time right now. <laughs> um, we are gonna talk about network security and we are gonna use some of the tools to uh, look at password crack in our lab. So that way you can experience it, okay? So I'm gonna go into screen share real quick. Okay, so this week we are doing the third week activities. Um, I have on agenda, we're gonna do an in-class assignment to address network security. Um, I'll walk you over the sonic wall configuration as many companies are using sonic wall. Um, so you can have some experience with using firewall. As I mentioned, the lab is gonna be on password crack. So when you experience the lab this week, you're gonna see what I had demo last week because that's what you asked for last week is to be able to explore some of the security tools. You have a 10 question quiz and all of these are due by, uh, except for the hands-on project. So the assignment, the lab and the quiz is due by next week. 
the hands-on project, I will probably extend it um, until the 17th if need be, but trying to turn it in by the 14th. So next week is going to be our last week. Uh, we are going to finish up the last part of security in week four, and that will wrap up your certificate and your course. Okay, so if you miss any of the earlier courses, we will likely offer these either summer or next fall. Um, we don't have any non-credit added to the schedule for the spring. I wanted to see how um, we're gonna address COVID with remote learning and the tools that you need for some of these hands-on classes. Any question before we start? Okay. So I'll minimize this. So this week, um, as you know, in cybersecurity, it's essential that you understand network technologies. And if you took the last class, CIS 824B, we had gone into details about different protocols and some of the information about networking. So this week, the, the beginning part is going to be some review, but we wanted to tie in the security measures uh, when you're using services and also protocols and ports. It's very important that you understand that so you can protect your network, home network or business. So um, in the beginning part, it talks about network protocols. We understand that TCP, transmission protocol, it is connection oriented. It has a three-way handshake. It needs to acknowledge that the connection is established in order to transmit data. So almost all our traffic on the internet and also on for your regular use at home, when you transmit or share files, ma the majority is gonna be TCP. There will be some traffic that's gonna be UDP and UDP doesn't need confirmation. So it just sends and it would open as it receives. Um, and you would see UDP being used for some faster services on the web. For example, if you're, um, using streaming radio, streaming video, uh, some of the services uses UDP. Now, many denial of services attacks use UDP. So when you look at how you're using your internet at home or the type of services that you have in your network, you have to consider that some of this traffic is UDP. So therefore we have to take precaution in what we're using as you know that now we require internet for the majority of the things that we do. And IP is mainly used for addressing. So as you know, we are now using IP version six, which is in hexadecimal and it is 128 bits. So we have longer address that's gonna give us more addresses for our networks. The earlier version that has been phasing out, some companies and organizations still use this. That's 32 bit addresses and it used decimal number. So 32 bit is gonna be very limited. So if you're looking at small, medium sized network, that will be okay. But if you're looking at enterprises network, we want to use IP version six. As you learn about ping and ping of death last week, right? Smurf attacks, how we can flood a network using ping. Ping uses ICMP. It stands for Internet Control Message Protocol. It's used to test connectivity and many networks have this enabled, but not all administrator allows this. So they might turn it on when it's needed and they might turn it off on their, and filter traffic that's ICMP. And as similar to UDP, 
what you see is a lot of denial of service attack uses ICMP. Now what we can do is we can use our network appliances to block ICMP. So you can set firewall rules to block ICMP. With that, if we block it, we won't be able to ping regularly. So you can enable it when you need to and you can disable it when you don't use it. And that's basically the rule of security, right? At home, on your phone, uh, turn off the services that you, you don't use, right? If you have wireless printer and wireless devices that you rarely use, you need to power it off because that opens a channel for somebody to come in or use that service against you. Um, ARP is very important in security um, and it's important in networking. Address resolution protocol, we use this to resolve version four address to the physical address of the system. And as you seen last week, we talked about how ARP can be poisoned because some of this information is stored to the device. So, um, or stored to the system. So what you see is that you want it to be able to monitor how all of this information is stored and used. So here it mentioned again, your are poisoning attacks and it would give it a false hardware address and it would redirect traffic to their own system. Next is your NDP. This is neighbor discovery protocol. This is used for IP version six and it's used to discover IP version six devices on the network. When they implemented IP version six, they decided that it would be better to implement a new protocol that would be automate a lot of the process for us. So in networks, NDP is used to discover devices that have version six addresses that's connected. And so you would often see this being used on a router. And then some of the things I wanna mention here is your real-time transport protocol, your RTP. This is used to deliver audio and video. So if you listen to iHeartRadio, right? Now, as we learn too that some of these protocols is coupled under the category of either UDP or TCP. So these protocol are categorized under either TCP or UDP, okay? Um, so when you go to work and if your work uses, you know, phones that are on digital networks, most of them are, you would see that uses VoIP or voice over IP. At home, you also use voice over IP uh, for the majority. We, we transitioned to this years back. Um, now, if you're streaming media, if you're on Twitch for games, if you are you know, uh, watching Netflix, in the back, it's actually using real-time transport protocol. Push talk devices like the walkie-talkie phones, that came out about 10 years ago, those also use um, RTP, okay? And also video conferencing like Zoom and other technologies also uses R uh, RTP, okay? So let's answer some of the questions that we have first. Um, for this week assignment, we just refer to the notes and answer the questions. So between TCP and UDP, which protocol de provides delivery assurance? That will be your transmission control protocol, TCP. It does a three-way handshake. So it's like your delivery person that asks for your signature before the delivery person gives you a package. Whereas UDP, it just drives by and throw that package in front of your door. And if you, whether you get it or not, it's really up to fate, right? So UDP doesn't have any confirmation and a lot of the data would just open as it receives. So it doesn't need to have the entire 
packet received in order to reassemble it. Whereas TCP, it waits till, till the confirmation, the connection is established, and then it would reassemble everything back into place and then present that, okay? For the second question, it says, why is address resolution protocol important in networking? It is because we use it to identify the correct system on the network so the packet can arrive to the correct system. So as the data enters the network, right, the router passes it in, it needs to narrow down on what part of the network does that system, is that system located? So as it comes in as IP address, finding the destination, it need, we need a way to convert, right? That address into a physical system address, which is the media access controller address or the MAC address, okay? So our ARP is very much like narrowing down on which house on the street that you live in, whereas IP, right, it's used to just identify the address number by looking at zip code or, you know, so the host portion of the network is really, you know, to that segment of the network. Um, so it's going to say, oh, this address belongs to this section of the network. It's going to get it there. But the switch job is to find that physical location by using the physical address or the MAC address. So ARP translate that and identify the correct system for you. Okay, And it's the same exact thing at home. Your wireless router receives, right, the data from, or yeah, the data from the web. And then in order to get it to your laptop or, you know, your TV or your smartphones, it, the wireless router at home also has a way to identify your physical address because it's built with the switch functionality. So it switched it to the proper system. In, an, in a business environment, we would use switch technology, right? As we would have a lot more systems connected. And then for number three, which protocol performs auto configuration on device IP version six addresses, discovery, the address for those devices, such as, you know, address of a router, that's gonna be your NDP. And for number four, what protocol is used to stream video over the internet? We talk about real-time transport protocol. And this is the majority of the traffic now, as you see when people are working from home or staying home more to use the technology, we would see RTP being used. And Keep in mind that all protocols have weaknesses, right? As they've been established over the years, even while we're updating the versions of the protocol, nothing is 100% safe in the world, right? Um, so when we're looking at security, we have to think about how we can implement protection and looking at vulnerabilities to make sure that we are proactive in protecting our systems. Okay. Any question regarding number one, two, three, and four? You can find all of the protocol listed on page one. These are some of the basics. So now if you attempt Security Plus certification with CompTIA, right? I heard that they're transitioning out the Security Plus certification. I think they're really pushing the new one, which is the CS, uh, the CYSA, specifically for security analysts and some of the other area like Pentest Plus. But for Security Plus, 
you have to understand protocol very much like Network Plus, but how to use the protocol for security. Okay, so some of the other protocols that is also working in the back and many of them you also using the majority of the time. So with the RTP, we later implemented uh, SRTP, so Secure Real-Time Transport Protocol. This one provides encryption, message authentication, and integrity. So it has enhanced level of security compared to your regular RTP. Now, we discussed in the last couple of weeks that like encryption, encryption is great in protection. However, it does slow down the processes. So keep in mind that when you need something that has that requires high throughput, right, fast traffic, then we have to consider what is the level of privacy we need to protect? How is that level going to impact the technology that we're using today? Okay, so now this SRTP was implemented to protect against replay attack or impersonation. So in the replay, they usually use that to uh, impersonate a system or a user, right? To be able, and you know, that would couple with man in the middle and some of the other form of attack, depending on the type of traffic and the objective of the attacker. So it is unicast, meaning that it sends one-to-one -one, and it also have multicast, it would send to one-to-many. So it, you have the options within the SRTP compared to the RTP, okay? So what's the difference between unicast, multicast, and broadcast, right? Um, if you don't recall or you don't know, broadcast is when we send to all, okay? Like broadcast television company, broadcast radio. Unicast is when you text message your friend, one-to-one -one system, right? I'm, you I'm send it to question. one person. Yes, question? Uh, I'm, my screen is too small again. If, I don't know, if, did we both get spotlit? So let me see if I, 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 I can change that for you. Okay, that should help now. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So as we can, we can send it to a group of people. So when you group chat or when you group text, that will be your multicast transmission, okay? Now, um, we also need a way to transfer file. So you have the file transfer protocol, it uses port 20 for data. And I have a typo on this one, port 21 for signal control. So it uses two ports, right? 20 for data and 21 for signal. The TFTP is Trivial File Transfer Protocol. It uses port 69 UDP. And we would use this for smaller amount of data amongst devices. So that's a little different than your regular. Now, some companies, they still use FTP to uh, distribute files. So for example, you might have an enterprise and they would put up a server. And in that server, they would have like forms for HR, forms for their employees for health benefits, um, things like that in their intra network. So they would have a website that would put up and the user would log into that website. And with that authentication uh, credential that would push over to the FTP server 
um, so that way the user can download data, access some of the forms, right? And they can also upload data. They can share files. Now you don't see as a common practice to have FTP server as much as what we've seen in the earlier years in that it does have a lot of flaws and we have to drill down on data permission control. So files we refer to as permission system. The control for this would be the privilege, right? What they, the user, what tasks they can accomplish. Um, so FTP is not quite common as it was before. However, companies still use them because if it's still working, they're not gonna change, okay? SSH is used for secure shell. Um, many times we can use SSH to directly connect to a certain system. So for example, uh, my student and I, when we use AWS, um, we would use SSH to connect to certain type of servers or certain type of routers and switches. So that way we can configure and manage that. And we, we would pass that traffic over the browser. And it's also, we have to also use um, remote access type of protocol with it. But with this, it encrypts the traffic and that allows us to securely transmit or communicate with the systems. Right. So if you want to implement file transfer protocol, it's better to implement it with SSH. OK, so this should couple with file transfer protocol. And the last one on this page here is SSL. And SSL had issues years back, and it's called the heart bleed, where the code for the protocol was open source and it's shared. So an attacker got a hold of it, found the weakness in the protocol. And at the time, lots of companies were using HTTPS with SSL. So a lot of the websites were being attacked based on the weakness of the, the source code for that protocol. So what happened is they had implemented the improvement to address the secure connection with the web. So SSL is rarely used now with the, your HTTPS. So when you authenticate to a website to pay bills, right, to access certain things, when you see HTTPS, some websites still use SSL, but rarely because, you know, of the issue that we came across in the past. So traffic that would be HTTPS, right, that would relate to SSL in the past. Um, there is some form of encryption that you use the same key to encrypt and decrypt, okay? So SSL sometimes would be used with the authentication process. So when you input your username and password in the past, that traffic, when it submits your username and password, that was really SSL in the back. It encrypts that traffic as it sends. Or when you're using SMTP. But later on, we implemented TLS. TLS is a replacement of SSL. So almost the majority of all the websites now uses TLS. So whenever that you visit a, a website and authenticate to access your profile, accounts, pay bills, etc., you're actually using TLS with HTTPS, okay? And other type of protocols piggyback on TLS, okay? And again, TLS also gives us encryption with the, with the established communication using you know, port-based or connection-based. So HTTPS uses port 443 
And some administrator, they would use uncommon port for HTTPS. However, um, you would see a TLS using port 443 with HTTPS. Okay, so port number is simply an, a, a number that we assign for specific protocol for a particular service. Um, so that way the system would understand that that service is tied with a, a port value and that port is used, right, to either communicate, to, re you know, receive data, to, so for many different functionality, we would use support. And that logical number could be tied to a physical connection on your system. So for question five, we can say that the protocol that's used for secure HTTP traffic would be your SSL and its replacement for number six is TLS. Any question with these? A lot of acronyms, right, in protocol, but understanding how things work is essential. So in order to secure system, we have to understand the network aspect of it, what is used. And protocols is just an agreed, established set of rules, right, that would be implemented for a particular type of service. So that way, no matter where you are in the world, right, you can still check your email, you can still access web to be able to authenticate, transfer file, download, etc. So it has to be agreed. So all the system would be able to support the same type of protocols doesn't matter what brand, what manufacturer, and that was the whole point. Okay, so just to review with the email, right? And also we wanted to talk about VPNs. As you look at different types of VPN, virtual private network, it's important to understand there are different grade of VPN or categories of VPN. So IPsec is a protocol that's used for a particular type of VPN. And it encrypts IP traffic. It's native to version six, but also work on the earlier IP version four address. What it does is it encapsulates and encrypts IP packet payloads because a lot of the attack is really payload oriented. They would look at your payload and find ways to capture that traffic or reroute or redirect that traffic. So let's think of it this way. Let's say that you would send a present to a friend and the way IPsec works is that we would wrap that present or put it in a box, lock it, right? So that way they don't see what's in it, even the address that's gonna go to your friend, okay? And then we would give it to the delivery person and that delivery person would hold the secret of where that packet is gonna go to, okay? So IPsec creates a tunnel mode where it encapsulates and encrypt the IP packet payloads information. So what does it look like? I took a picture of this so you can see, okay? So all packets have a header and on that header, think of it like a mailing label. We would have source destination, information about that packet, okay? So as it goes through the layers in the OSI, 
what we want to do is the data, the raw data is pretty much, you know, it could be in all different pieces, okay? So number one, when we're using VPN in IPsec, it requires that packet to be authenticated and it added a section to the header to protect that header from being viewed, okay? So when it goes into the tunnel mode, that's kind of like putting it into a lock box where nothing can be seen, not even the label, okay? Now inside it, right, using that mode, it's still gonna be able to transmit to the proper destination system based on specific field. However, from an external unauthorized user standpoint, the, the, the external user cannot see, right, when they're trying to sniff out that data. So with this, what we can do is we can establish the server that would support virtual private network, or in some cases, you would have companies that service this type of virtual private network. And in my opinion, IPsec is one of the best. Um, now, as you see, it requires a lot of overhead. So in virtual private network that is highly secure, we normally just have about a few connections. So when you're looking at executive or system that have sensitive data that needs to be communicating or user that would require, you know, more privacy, we would put them onto the virtual private network type of service. So you don't put everybody on it because it just require a lot of system resources, um, very much like all the other cryptography based technology. Okay. Any question as far as IPSEC? Okay, so here it actually shows you what a header would look like, right? And this checksum right here, usually that field is more on, you know, taking a look at the integrity of that packet. Um, with the, with it, as in any cryptography type of technology, you have to have some form of key to lock and unlock. Um, it would have a sequence number to make sure that your data would be placed back into the proper order. Um, and then on the top, it would list the protocol type. So the way they organize this is very much like a mail label, right? Like we would write our name, our address, our city, our zip code. And then in, in the case where you mail it internationally, you would put the country code and so forth. So. A packet does the same thing. It would have a proper list of information that would re be required so that way it can see, right? Where is it going to? Where is that coming from? And on that label, it also say, let's say if you're shipping a package, it would say how much is the weight of this? What does it look like when, when it puts everything back together? Okay, um, another protocol I added here using port 22 is your secure file transfer protocol. This is used for FTP, for file transfer at the secure level. It's an extension of SSH. So when you see this, you know that it uses SSH. Okay, so secure file transfer protocol is an extension of secure shell. And these technologies existed for a long time. I think that as we see the need for it more frequently now, more people are adapting to it. But a lot of these protocols been written from the 70s to the 80s and even the 90s. 
Okay, let's talk about mail and email. So SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, right? This is implemented with the email servers like Microsoft Exchange. So when you're using your student email, then you're using this protocol, the server is using this protocol to make sure things get to the proper inbox based on user account, okay? So it uses port 25. So when you look at your wireless router at home, you would see that some of the ports are disabled like this, port 25, because if you're not hosting mail server from your home, those, the, that port is not, not gonna be functional. Now, let's say that if I run my business from my home, I put up a server, not only that I enable the port, I have to contact the service provider, your internet service provider, to let them know that I enabled this port because their system has to also transfer, right? Because they are the transfer agents to my mail server. So their system has to be able to communicate with mine in order to work. Um, POP3 is used for your client email, like Gmail, Yahoo, um, even AOL mail, if that's older, um, Outlook.com. Now, Outlook.com, sometimes company would tie that back to SMTP on their servers. So when you use web-based mail or client email, you would see POP3. Um, and when you authenticate, let's say that you go to your Gmail account or live.com and you put in your username and password, it uses SSL or TLS to get that encrypted transmission so you can access your mail. Now, it doesn't mean that we're 100% safe though, okay? Because it's as safe as your credential. So if your credential is leaked, Lately, a lot of it is leaked, right? On Google, on Apple, and even on Microsoft. So you should think about how you authenticate to the system. Is my credential safe? And in the back, it's using SSL or TLS, port 995. Another protocol that's used for email is MIME. I forgot to highlight this. So MIME is an extension of your messages that would support ASCII text, attachment, video, images, application. So when you're sending an attachment to a, to a person, right, like a funny picture, like a GIF, or if you're sending, you know, voice messages, um, you are actually using mine, okay? So as you see, not one protocol would work for everything. So what they do is they add these protocol to support various areas of the email need because back then when email was established, it was just very plain text, right? You can't even, you know, format your email to look a certain way then we saw that, yes, we need to make sure that we can attach a file, we can make our email look a certain way, so other protocols were implemented to support that. And um, another protocol that we see is also Internet Message Access Protocol IMAP, and IMAP is also used for client webmail. And IMAP has a requirement in the particular area. So now in your email, when it transfer your email, like now that they require virus scan, all of that information is in the email header. Uh, you, you might not see it, right? You see it from the user that, oh, my service provider offers virus scan or anti-malware scan before I download the attachment. But if if you scan or if you have the capability to scan, all the server system sees that, OK? 
okay? So all your, all your, your transfer agents going from one system to the next to get to your account, it actually keeps track of, you know, who is that coming from, what servers were involved to transfer this. And uh, going back to like the forensic side, we see all of that. So when a person commit email fraud, it's very apparent to us. Like we can see when we, when we pull the email records, we can see all of that. Like when it was initiated, what is the timestamp, whether they scan virus or not, which transfer agent, which servers were involved, right? So if a person falsified the identity of a user, let's say that your email account was hacked, and they go in and they impersonate you to send that information, all of that is tracked. So it footprints across all different systems. So attacking is not an easy approach. It's a very layered approach. For an experienced attacker, they have to really study, right? And, and if, they, if they are good at covering their tracks, whether it's email or network attacks, they really have to, you know, really plan out the process. Now, the, the ones that don't know what they're doing, they can quickly be discovered. Um, as now, a lot of our security professionals are very well versed on how systems sees a lot of the different areas, right? So when we look at an incident responding to an attack, like, you know, or an incident of an email fraud or a malware that's coming in, we can see from the network side, from the client system side, from the file side. And even if it's deleted, we can still see, you know, pieces of it. Okay. All right. Um, so in the next question, you can put down that the protocols that's used for email is your... SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, IMAP, POP3, and MIME, M-I-M-E. Okay. Okay. Any question regarding email? Um, I, I kind of have a question regarding that that you mentioned uh, about email, um, how they can track it and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder about stuff because um, in in, in Chafee, at least in Chafee, it's very common that um, our emails keep getting um, hacked, at least the staff emails. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they told me we just email spoofing, but it doesn't seem like GP has it under control. So I'm kind of wondering if it's just like a really good hacker or some other. Oh, they just, they fish. It's really easy to fish for email, right? Like, so what I would do, okay? And I teach ethical hacking sometimes. So what I would do is I would get a user to fill out something for me and use that credential. And so that this is why, and it happens at RCCD also, because people fall for these tricks. So once I get the credential, I can go in and either escalate the privilege, make myself, you know, depending on how that email server is configured. Uh, many times schools or institutions or organizations they use Microsoft product like Exchange um, and that ties to DNS and Active Directory. So from that, you can trickle in and there are many tools that you can scan for email servers that, are, that have web presence, like even organization servers. So for a school like Chafee or a school like, like us, right? In order to have everybody access, we would allow web access going through outlook.com, which is serviced by Microsoft, right? So we do the, that exchange server has to be connected from uh, a way that like we would see it, 
with the web. Okay, and there's scanners that can use for that. It would look for the MX services and would find the agents that does that. Um, and then with that, what happens is a lot of the times they would use application firewall. So I'm gonna get to that in a little bit, but in a network environment, you have a section that would be connected to the web. You cannot shield it because you have to make sure that people can see it so they can access it. So a lot of times they would put in application firewall to kind of screen some of that. So it could be that the firewall is not picking up and blocking certain traffic coming from externally. Now, an attacker, if they come from an external you know, source that's going through that way, they have to defeat that firewall, right? Unless the firewall is no good, it's not tracking what it's supposed to do or blocking what it's supposed to do, then, then that would be a route that I would get into the network, into that email server, into user accounts. But from an attacker standpoint, it's a lot easier to trick someone to give me their access information and get in instead of trying to defeat the firewall because the firewall will raise the alarm right away. Um, and firewall is only as good as its rules. So, you know, so if I was the administrator for that institution, I have to look at several areas, right? The application firewall or the protection point for that system. And then I should take a look at the, the user. So when you when when something is fish or, or a traffic that happens, you can see all of this from a network standpoint. So let's say a user get an email and they tried to they, they were being fish, you would see that, right? So when you investigate that incident, that that source that's coming in, you would see that from the server and also the client account. So um, I had shown my forensic class on the Gmail account where that, how that looks like, right? Somebody impersonate somebody else because in order to impersonate somebody's email, you have to capture that message too. Like if I'm trying to access your email, I have to be able to forward it to me so I could see it, right? So it's gonna come back to a certain system or a certain account. And usually it goes to, a, a, it's being forwarded to another account. And we can see that with the, the middle system, the transfer agent, and also the destination. I don't know if, if you understand. So let's, it's kind of like forwarding your addresses, like when you move, right? So let's say that I go to an empty house. I pretend to be you. I apply for a bunch of credit cards, right? I have to either stand there and get the mail or I have to, you know, forward those mail to my home. So we have to find where that is being forwarded to, right? And, or the type of system they use in between to forward that, that email. And when it gets into the domain of, technology company, you have to have court order and all of these other things in place to be able to pull the account information because, you know, it's privacy and uh, you have to get the legal system involvement with that. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't understand it now. It just, it just seems like a way, way more difficult, I guess, for the, for the blue team or the defenders to really uh -huh. secure, secure this. Right, thank you. Yep. So um, we, we can combat to a certain extent. I think we operate a lot of the time in a responsive manner, right, for most part. So from, from a security standpoint, if you want to protect your email system, you would have to think about how would they get in and be able to protect those points. Um, and attackers know that users, you know, is your weakest link. So they're gonna go for that first, right? If they can't get through on that end, then they would try to defeat your system because defeating systems, it leaves footprint, 
and they have to spoof their 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 addresses to be able to cover that up but if you layer your security protection it makes them hard it's harder for them to go through we're just buying time really we're not we're not foolproof all the time so you're just buying a little bit of time so you can you can find ways to stop them right or deter them uh, for most part okay okay so http https information is here we touched a little bit on that now on Windows environment, um, it uses Kerberos. I touched a little bit on this last week. This is used for authentication in Windows domain, and it uses key base and timestamp tickets. So think of it like when you go to an amusement park, right? And then you show them your ID to buy the tickets. And then on the ticket, it prints your name or when you go to a game, right, like a baseball game or, or, or a football game, et cetera. So it uses a system to issue you a key and with that key, you can enter the park, okay? And it also has a ticket timestamp. So it's gonna say you can access the system, right, at this time, okay? You can enter the amusement park or the, 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 the ball game arena at this time. And we can make it where it would forever distribute that key and, and have the tickets, you know, that's gonna, doesn't have any kind of expiration or in a better security approach, we would tighten it so that way it would be limited to, you know, specific sessions. So Kerberos uses port 88. So in a Windows environment, this is what we use. And then LDAP is used for user account, group membership, system account. Um, as you know, some of the system, it doesn't have any user. It would automate some of the process. So this is used for Active Directory in a Windows environment. Um, SNMP, this is used for network time synchronization and you know, I touched on this in the last class, but just to review, when you use this, not only that you're able to sync with NTP with the time that you would update time for time change, but we mainly use it to sync, you know, data, um, you know, or updated system information. Because in most system, in most uh, server environment, you would have a small window of time um, to be able to sync. So as my analogy for your bank account, right? When you use uh, withdrawal and things on your bank account, it keeps a record of it, but it doesn't really sync to their main system un you know, until they set it as a batch file to update your account. So this is why when you pay your bill and they tell you, oh, it's gonna take 24 to 48 hours to update your account is because it doesn't process it real time. You there's a wait, right? So they would schedule it for a certain time. And at that time, the, com the system that it, it's communicated to has to be in sync. Otherwise it doesn't work, okay? Um, on the IP addresses, IANA is the authorization, the authority that governs right, the IP version four and IP version six addresses. So companies would have a set of addresses that they can use and you see public address, right? Like Verizon, AT&T, you know, uh, different companies in the world. And with that, they can use within that range, okay? So as we ran out of IPv4, because there are more devices that need public IP, then we have to implement IP version six. So they're in charge of assigning specific IP. Some IP addresses are used for like routers and automated based systems, okay? And then some IPs would go to, um, you know, certain company. So in version four, Microsoft used to own the most IP addresses. So what they did was they knew that IP version four would run out. 
So what they did was they would buy lots and lots of addresses. Um, they would register for them and they would pay for them. And then they would resell it to other companies. And Microsoft still owns a lot of version four addresses publicly, okay? And that's how people used to be able to, to get addresses for their organization is to register and pay. So let's answer the next question. The primary differences between version six and version four is that IP version four, it uses decimal notation and it's 32 bits, much shorter. And decimal, so when I say decimal, what does that mean? It means zero through nine, our counting number. So this is why when you're looking at the IP version four number, right? It represents our, it uses the counting number. Every dot, when we say 172 dot something, that period represents, each section of that represents an octet, right? Eight bits. So as you have four, right? That would represents the 32 bit address size. The version six address, it uses hexadecimal number system, and that would be A through F and zero through nine in combination. And it's a longer address because it's using a different number system. So it uses hexadecimal notation and it has much more addresses. So there are talk about, there's talk about we're running out of MAC addresses, yes, that's true, okay? Because we have so many appliances and devices that are manufactured. So they are thinking about ways to have a different system used for MAC addresses and MAC addresses also use hexadecimal. So eventually we will run out of IP version six, but way down the line, right? So you do see some limitation with these addresses. Okay, any questions regarding address? So for the IP version six, it looks like this. Okay, so class A, you have a lot of addresses in class A. So when you see an IP address is like this, 10.10.10. .10 .10 uh, let's say that's zero dot one. This is in class A address, okay? How do I know? Because my, the number, the first octet right here, the first number is in this range, okay? Or what if you have 127.0.0.1 like this? It is still a class A address because the first number is in this range. Now it uses the subnet mask. So think of this like an area code on your phone or a zip code, right? It uses this value to kind of narrow down on what network that is, right? And in the class A, it has fewer networks, but you can have more system on each of the network. So if you're looking at like schools where they have so many computers, so many students or an enterprise, they would likely use class A version four address. At home, you're using class C because you don't have that many devices. So each network can have up to 256 systems, right? But you can have more of the little networks. So class C is more little networks. Class A is fewer networks, but larger in, in the, system, the number of system that it can connect, okay? And then you do see some class B. So if I have, the first number that's gonna range in this, that will be class B. And you would have this many number of networks and on each of the network, you can have up to right, this many systems. So if I need more than, more than let's say 50,000, I can 
computers connecting, then I can use class B. If I need millions of computers connecting, I would use class A. If I need like in the hundreds, like less than 256, like at home, I would use class C. And this is used for private addresses for inside the network, okay? So this is kind of, this is a very brief summary, right? Like we can spend a whole class on, and if you take Cisco classes or if you take CIS 40A, that really address the network class and we can go more into the details. So when it looks at that, what does it really look like? There's certain size in the bits where it's gonna dedicate to the network and the host. So it's kind of like saying that this part of the zip code really says that what city that you live in and then the extension of the zip code, the dash and the little numbers that follow it that would represent, you know, maybe the street area or the zone of that zip code. So it, the system would use certain section of the bits to really determine what kind of address it is, right? And that's gonna point back to what network it is. Okay. So I just took this image so you can see that. Here's the version six address. Looks a little different, okay? So they do a better job in putting together the version six um, on how the header would look compared to version four. So it looks at the traffic class. It has a flow label, payload length, okay? And then it also track the next header. So, you know, it's, it, is more efficient and it performs better. So it contains more details on how that packet would be transmitted um, in a more of a, an effective, efficient way when they redesign the, the, the IP. Okay, uh, we worked on DNS last week. So here's a picture of it. Right. So when you visit like example.com, it's going to take you to the web server. That web server is going to take that traffic to the DNS root, the domain. Okay. And it's going to say, oh, I, that still so using HTTP, right? And then transfer that to the DNS. It uses the record to really reference is this user part of this domain, okay? So here it gives you the steps on how DNS communicate. So every time that you visit a website, that website belongs to a domain um, and that domain record exists on the DNS system. Okay, now can I, can I make a web server at home and create DNS? Sure, right? Um, on Windows environment, you if you create a web server, you use IIS, right? And then you can also use Apache and Linux on the Linux side, et cetera. But you, the web server, it won't, that service would just serving some of the requests. You still have to tie it to a domain system, right? Like your DNS. So you can install that role onto a server operating system like server 2016 for Microsoft. Now, if you do that from home, you have to, again, initiate that service and you have to tell your service provider that this, you gonna have a different type of traffic, right? So a lot of the times we just acquire the host right, service with companies like GoDaddy or, you know, so they would have the domain, GoDaddy domain, and then under that, you would have the subdomain that would tie to your website, okay? So um, they already have the service in place. We can just lease it, pay for the service. Okay, so here's some information about the DNS records. Right, and you worked on your lab last week. 
So it points to which host, which address is, in, is that host. It points to the host name. If you're using version six, it uses the quadruple A record. Then you have the pointer record. That's the opposite of the A record where it, it does the reverse. Here, remember I mentioned about email. So when you tie your, your, your email server to that DNS and the Active Directory, it creates an MX exchange record. It identifies which mail server for that domain. And you can have many email server under that domain, okay? You don't, most company, technology company like Google, they would have many to service the amount of users that they have. Um, C name is an alias. So it can use multiple name for one IP. Um, SOA, this is used for caching results. So that way it would perform quicker. Uh, we don't want to just for it to resolve each time. So the first time it resolve, it's gonna store that and refer to that information later. And then you worked on DNSSEC that provides validation for the DNS response, okay? So to, to troubleshoot it, you can use NSLOOKUP to look up who is the DNS, right? What IP address that is. And in Linux, uh, that would use dig command in the terminal. So you can dig for the DNS information. Here's the port information. Here in the ports is also governed by IANA. So, there are specific common ports. These are the registered ports. And then some of the ports could be private and dynamic. Now the server ports is gonna tie with the URL. So when you're looking at a URL, you might see some symbol that is a way that we can tie the server port information into the URL. Now, your browser, the way that they updated the security is it scrambles the URL, right? So that way it's not transparent anymore because there's also a way that we can inject things into URL to make it do certain things, right? To connect to certain server. It's a form of attack as well. So now they redesigned the browser to scramble it so that way it's not very visible, but you can still find it, okay? So the important takeaway from this is to disable the port and the services that you don't use, okay? So when you look at the wireless router at home, right? Look at the things that are there and if it's open or enable and then you don't use it, turn it off. Okay, and if you're not sure, you can research it before you disable something that might Im Im impact other people at home. I think I double pack this. Okay, so let's talk about network devices. I mentioned the switch is used to get the data to specific system inside the network. Switch uses MAC addresses, okay. Now, some switch is higher in layer that it would operate as a router. And also we can set up virtual local area network with certain switch. Some switch could be used for voice over IP. So a way that they can attack a switch is they can flood the Mac, okay? Because the switch store a list of Mac addresses for different part of the networks. So what they can do is they can overload that switch and take down the network segment. This was popular back then, not as much anymore because the target is different now, right? Like why, why do I care about that switch? Unless that switch is an uplink switch to the main backbone of my network, then they would, they would try to flood it, okay? So now how easy it is to attack a switch. Uh, you can walk by a switch 
right? You can plug yourself into a switch and attack that switch. Or if you can find a way to connect to that switch, you can attack that switch. So as an administrator, I used to tell my technician that, yes, you have to disable the physical port on that switch. So if I have a switch that has 48 connection, and if I'm only connecting 40 system, I need to stop, right? Disable the physical connection of the other eight. Because if it's still trans, if somebody can go by and plug in a, a, an ethernet cable and there I go, right? Like they can take down that switch or unplug the power from my switch. So I have to make sure that I physically secure it. So in a network environment, if they install it properly, you cannot physically just unplug the switch, right? Um, a lot of the technician and administrator, they do a good job on configuring the switch, but they don't think about how that switch can be powered down, right? So that's something you should think about if you implement that on your network. The router is to route data from one network to the next network. So it's a way that we can transfer data from one network to another network and you use your wireless router at home. You can also use it to bridge servers, okay? So some of the things that you wanted to do for your router, you can set up dedicate route for essential data, right? To really send it on a specific path. So that way other traffic will not intervene with it. Um, you can make it where it would be anti-spoofing, where we would only allow and block specific addresses. So a lot of the routers now, like your wireless router at home, has that functionality, okay? So we can think about how we would manage the traffic. You can implicitly deny specific traffic you can set up protocol and port numbers that would only accept certain ports from certain addresses from certain network. So the access control list on the router is very important. Just like how you would, would configure that from home, you can set, you know, you can whitelist it where you would allow only certain things. You can blacklist it, you can block certain things, okay? So I think router does more than just routing traffic, right? We can control the routes. We can control the traffic. Okay, any question? So a little bit on the aggregation switch. We can connect many switches together and we call that bridging, okay? On the firewall, if you, if you use firewall, there's so many different types of firewall and we're gonna do a hands-on project where I would introduce you to a type of firewall that's very commonly used, okay? Cisco is one of the company that, that creates technology that's been used for a long time, but now we have a lot of different options. So firewall, it could be a software, it could be a hard, box hardware appliance. Uh, in, in many businesses, you would see it as a box, right? And basically all that does is like, it's filters. So think of it like a screen door to your house, right? We can have that screen very thick or we can have that screen very thin. We can have it locked. We can make it screen certain things right? We can make it screen certain type of traffic. Um, now, let's say that screen door, we would put a camera system on it to monitor, and we would make sure that the, you know, the proper people would come in and out of the house. So firewall is only effective for the functionality and the purpose based on how you set it to, to, to be. And firewall should not be the only protection measure that you have in the network because it can be defeated. 
So when we say a host-based firewall, usually that's a software that's installed on a host, which is a server or a system or a computer. Application-based firewall usually also is a software. Sometimes that could be a box, but most of the time you would see it as a software. It would contain rules on what kind of traffic would be threat-based and it would have a list of all the traffic that's coming through. So like that screen door analogy, right? As soon as the person comes through, it would record Tom, right? Maria, whoever that goes through that screen door, it's gonna say, this is the time. And this is the time, uh, this is the person or the type of traffic. Network-based firewall. Yes, question? Uh, I'm just, uh, I. Uh, Googling here, and I see that uh, the aggregation switches are, are used to connect Tor switches. What is a, a Tor switch? So a Tor switch is like Tor router. You you layer it, you onion it, so it passes back and forth. So a lot of times, people in traditional way, I should say, people set up switches in a very traditional manner where. I can go from one switch to another, like a point to point, as you can say, right? But what if we make it where it, it smartly switch across so traffic will be harder to follow? So you can use aggregation switch in that I don't make it going from one point to the next point to the next point or all of them going to one central switch, right? That's the traditional way. What you can do is you can make them all distributed, uh, non-distributed, um, where you know different parts of the networks is able to switch back and forth. So it's harder to kind of follow um, and and to really identify the traffic. You um, it if in an existing network, if you have a traditional network, when you reconfigure that network not only that if you wanted to aggregate it where it would be tor based you would have to physically relocate some of these things outside of the logical configuration for that network but are you actually adding tor to a switch mm -hmm. that service but then again you should ask yourself is that service Say, right? People use people use that for you know anonymous base access, but do you want that to be non-transparent to you as an administrator? Because you wanted to see traffic, you wanted to identify what system, you wanted to be able to monitor who's doing what. What if you have an internal threat? So no solution is going to be completely beneficial both sides, right? Um, in a peer-to-peer -peer environment, if they set it up where, you know, you would have different file sharing type of system communicating, they might want it to do it that way, um, where you would have aggregated switch for these servers to communicate for those racks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, uh, coming back to this. So network-based firewall is gonna be your screen door, outgoing incoming traffic. Um, now, if you place it right at the edge of your network, that could be called edge or border firewall, right? Um, and the rules on the firewall that could be stateful or stateless, so if you are controlling it permission, source, destination, and port, like your Windows firewall, that's gonna be stateless rules. For the stateful rule, it would inspect based on decisions or the state of that traffic. So if I can have it where it would be stateful to block denial of service attack, right? Like it's gonna say, oh, wow, there's 500 you know, requests or packets that's coming in and it doesn't even look at the destination, right? It's just saying that, oh, this is the pattern of that traffic, it's gonna block it. 
for the stateless firewall rule, how we block the denial of service is we're saying, oh, anything outside of this scope, right? All, if it's coming from this source, it's gonna block it. And um, when you're looking at a firewall, a lot of the times it's gonna say, oh, this is the encrypted traffic. This is a non-encrypted traffic. This is um, a traffic that could, some firewall would tell you it's coming from China. It's coming from, you know, Ukraine. It's coming from, you know, specific type of network. And so if we, if, if we block it by destination and source and port, that will be stateless. If we block, block it by the pattern of the state of the traffic, like I said, you know, 5,000 packets trying to come through and they look the same, right? Then the decision is stateful, okay? So um, now we don't just use firewall, right? We would use IDS, it stands for intrusion detection system. And in some manufacturer would create a box that would have many functionality, right? Uh, so you can have an IDS with a certain security appliance. You can also have an IPS, which is intrusion prevention system that would be preventing threats, right? So in the next part, it talks about host-based intrusion detection system that's to the operating system. So the, whenever you hear the term host-based, it's a software, likely, okay? So this would protect the host system. So when you're doing like Windows Firewall or when you're using like Symantec, software or you know those type of software that's host based okay now when we're talking about intrusion detection system all that is is it's gonna look at like who is external and who's internal right as soon as it sees an, an external unauthorized system or user it's gonna raise the alarm okay so the intrusion detection system is an alarm system. All it is is going to notify you. It's going to say, oh, I see threats, right? This is the system. Or I see this traffic, and this is the system. So all it is is an alarm system. Now, the prevention system, it actually raises an alarm, and it stops it. So that's the true difference, okay? So on the detection, it monitors your traffic based on the network interface card. It also can be used to detect malware if it's host base. It's a good extra layer protection. So I don't, you know, I don't say that it's not completely not useful. It is useful in a sense where you should have it accompanying other type of products in the business. It's good for monitoring applications, okay? So you often see application-based, right, detection system as software because it's looking at application as, you know, could somebody coming in from a certain application, could a threat come in as, as uh, through an application? Okay, for the network base, it's gonna look at traffic it's unable to, it's not gonna be able to decrypt and that's the detection system. So it's only gonna look at the traffic. If you have encrypted traffic, it's not gonna be able to know what that is, okay? For the network-based one. And it's a good way that we can use it for monitoring. It's kind of like putting the surveillance camera on your wall outside, right? Or even inside the house but that when someone is wearing a mask, it's not gonna know who that person is, right? So that the network one doesn't see encrypted traffic. It sees it, but it doesn't know what it is. Okay, so this should be placed inside the network after the firewall. So let's take a look at this diagram so I can show you what that looks like. <coughs> okay, so we have this network. 
on this side, you would see that this is the user side, right? You got the computer, the printers, things that they use. And then on the web side, they have the web server and some database, okay? Now, and then they have a set of critical servers like DNS, DHCP, right? Other type of servers located here, okay? Now, physically, when you look at this in a company, right? This area right here can be one rack, okay? It would have the servers on the rack. It would have all the appliances on the rack. But when we configure it, we would separate it by putting in the configuration for our appliances. So you would have, this one is the network detection system, okay? What I would do to this one too, is I would implement an application-based firewall for these two, okay? And I would separate it as a DMZ, demilitarized zone. So it's kind of like a landing space between the internet and your network, okay? So what you can do is you can, you can put those servers in a section where it would be visible to the public, which is the people who are visiting your website, but the attacker coming in from that, you wanna protect it. So how do I protect that? I would put a firewall, right? I would put some type of system that's going to screen all of that and block all of the things and protect that area so that way it's safe for my network and the public, okay? So in this one, what we have is we have a firewall right for this side and we have a firewall for this side okay and what we have here is we put the nids inside because you wanted to be able to detect threat inside and also once they get in you still want to be able to detect it um, if you only put it on the outside like this only right once they get in you're done okay now, something that would be missing from this, I, if, I, if I'm a consultant for this, I would redesign this part right here, okay? Because they can funnel in from the website, right? Bypass this and then get their way through here. So what I would do is I would separate this and put it on a separate network and also put a firewall there too. Um, now, when you have too many screen, that can also create issues. But uh, so because we have a firewall here to protect this and this firewall can specifically, we can configure it to protect this side as well, right? Now, the downside in that is if they take down this firewall, then you're done because you have one for these essential area, the public side and the private side and so, you know, so might want to consider application firewall here, move this firewall for these critical servers. So as you can see, network design is very important in security. It comes back to that and configuring and managing it. Okay. So um, for the IDS detection, you wanted to look at the data trends, the logs, right? So for the analysts, for the security side, that's what they're gonna look at. They're gonna look at the appliances, the security system and the logs that are generated. And then based on that, right, we can create a certain trend that would be work, that will be a, a, a good a base for our working network. Um, and then we can also look at ways to protect our network based on those logs. False positive, false negative, that can go for your security software as well, right? Alert an event when it's non-threatening, false positive, right? 
like if you're familiar with cartoons that's like chicken little the sky is falling right but it's not the false negative is when it doesn't see attack when it's happening right so i rather be that the system is false positive than false negative however false positive is gonna slow down the throughput or reduce the throughput and availability okay so when you shop for tools you think about you know the weight in in that and how we would determine the risk so i rather it detect everything as threat than not detect anything at all so to answer the next question this is on your quiz the differences between false positive and false negative, false positive alert on an event that is non-threatening or harmless and false negative, it does not detect active attack or see threats. And remember, just like anything, the system is only as good as its rules or definitions. Okay. Any question? Okay. Um, next is your IPS here. So intrusion prevention system, it detects and prevent. So as you know, with more feature, of course, that appliance is gonna be more in cost and administration okay so we don't just monitor we we can block so we can do in line with the traffic right so as all the traffic passes in you can have it called in band where it would have to you can work with the router to have it set to screen also the router um, we can look at malicious behavior now, a lot of the new systems are very intuitive. So it actually automate and it gives you a big picture on what your normal network would look like. And then, you know, so outside of that behavior, outside of that range, it's going to, you know, we can have it raise an alarm and you can adjust that range. So we can inspect and block malicious packets. So the prevention does a better job at blocking, okay? So going back to the number nine, IDS is used for detection and IPS is used for prevention. IDS does not prevent attack and it does not, it cannot analyze encrypted traffic. Okay, what if an attacker coming in as encrypted traffic? It won't be able to see it. Okay. Okay, any question? Okay, next is the SSL TLS accelerator. And as we learned that TLS and SSL is used for HTTPS. So we can implement hardware devices to handle that type of traffic, TLS traffic. And we would place it with the related device so we can manage the cryptography and the sessions. So what would be the related devices, right? The, the systems that are filtering, the systems that are routing traffic to that particular area. So that will be on the DMZ side. So you would see some accelerator being implemented with web servers and you know, possibly tying back to also email servers and so and such, depending on if you are using HTTPS for your um, company to access resources. Then they also have a thing called SSL decryptors, right? This is used with a network intrusion prevention system. 
and the it's usually built into the prevention system that it decrypts the traffic so it can look in it and see right what kind of traffic it is where is that coming from where is it going to etc And then we can have the SDN. This is software defined network, often used with virtualization environment. So we can have it where we would control data path or traffic. So we can separate it. So you don't have to physically separate it. You can logically set it up so that way it will be separated, okay? Because we learn throughout time that we don't have to buy additional boxes, appliances to get more security out of our network, right? We can use different technologies to really segregate different areas of our network. So there are different type of solutions. And if you have boxes, that's great. You can implement SDN to really maximize your network potential and control your network capability and access. Honeypots, I don't recommend using honeypots unless it's for testing purposes, okay? And when you test, you have to be extra, extra careful. Like I would, I would have, a sandbox and I would separate it from the rest of my network because if you lure attackers to the system and if that system is connected to the rest of your network and you don't secure it properly, you can take down your entire network. Honeypots was very popular in the 90s and early 2000 because a lot of the administrators was trying to study the, the traffic pattern and how to better secure their network. Um, you do see some larger company using Honeypot to test, you know, and security companies, sometimes they would use it to test. But for a regular medium, small size business, I don't recommend using Honeypot because it diverts attacker to certain area of your network. And if you don't protect it, you can kill your network. Okay, um, so really we can look at the pattern of attacks. We can also use that pattern to better protect our system, okay? Um, it doesn't really have a lot of protection. It's pretty open when we design honeypots so they can quickly bypass it. So our government uses Honeypot, right, to gather intelligence um, outside of the technological company, of course. So you, you would see Honeypots being used for, you know, different areas of security, but not in, you know, in general practice, we don't use it all the time, okay? It's advice against. So HoneyNets is a group of Honeypots we can have it in different parts of a simulated network. And you would do this virtually, of course, okay? And so you would attract attackers to the honey nets, which is multiple system. So things like you can make any system to be honeypot really. You can have servers or you can even have, you know, system that would have storage and you can throw fake uh, files on there that looks important. Uh, you can make a fake web server or a honeypot server that would be web-based and then try to lure them. But again, right, we wanted to keep that separate from the regular network. So for the honeypot, it lure attacker or divert attacker to a certain system or an area of the network.
Okay. Any question? So you can find honeypot information on page nine, and that is for question number 12. Okay. So next we're gonna talk about um, wireless security and also security for your network at home. So wireless networks is common. I think nowadays everybody has a wireless network and some are better in protection than others. Um, public networks is never safe to access um, in general, right? For simple access is okay, but never for to keep private information. So with the security for this, <clears throat> how do we really secure our, our wireless side? Okay. Uh, number one, you can start with separating the physical network. So when you see these, these uh, public wireless network, we don't really have any essential data on that right? It will just simply be an access point so people can access it to surf the web maybe. And on that, when you connect it to the switch, you got to make sure that you would configure that and set that up so that way it's not going to impact the security for the rest of your network and keep in mind that that's important, okay? Um, we need to make sure that it detects rogue devices. So how do we do that? We can set up a physical address filtering, like a MAC address. So at home, you can do that. You can add all the MAC addresses for your family members, the systems that you have, and allow those. Anybody outside of that is not allowed, okay? Because even if you use encrypted wireless key, people can still brute force your key, they can capture your key, they can do a lot of things to get onto your network if they want to. Now, we can also set it as a virtual local area network where it would still physically be in it, but we can separate it using IP addresses, using configuration so that way it sees it as a different network and in order to pass the traffic it has to go through other type of systems like router and switches and we can also control system information right or system accounts on that virtual local area network okay so really quickly the basics Access point connects clients to the wired network, right? Access point has routing capability. So people say, oh, I have an access point, right? That could also be a wireless router. All wireless routers are access point, but not all access point are wireless routers. Keep in mind. So you might see some access point that are not wireless router, and, but when you buy a wireless router, you can use it as access point. Okay. So that would help us answer number 13. What's the difference between access point and router? All wireless routers are access point, but not all access point are wireless routers because some access point don't route, okay? They're just meant to be connected to the larger network. Then it cannot route from one network to the next. That's what I mean. It can still use as a connection. So in that sense, that access point is just simply a switch, right? Or a repeater or a hub. But all wireless router can be used to connect you to the larger network and the wireless router can be used to route from one network to the next network.
Okay. A lot of people mix them up, right? And or they don't know the true difference, but yes, there is a difference. Okay, so let's go over some of the basic. This will be likely the review for many of you. Okay. So um, physical ports are the wired access and we want to connect the wireless access point to our network using the physical cable right connection, just like how you connect with your service provider. FAT AP is standalone and it's autonomous access point. We can use it to connect our clients to the rest of the network. These are configured separately, FAT AP, okay? They are a little different. Your thin access point, it would be the controller base AP. They are not standalone. They meant to be working together and it's managed by controllers. So when you're looking at Moreno Valley College, they have a lot of different access point, right? And those access point is controlled by a system in the RCCD network, okay? Now, FAT AP, those are separate, right? They're a different entity and you do see some service provider uses FAT AP, right, for wireless connection to their network, right? They, they are not managed centrally. They are separate entity that would be connect. So they see each other as peers where one doesn't control the other. Whereas thin AP, you would have one system that's controlling could be hundreds of access points, thousands of access points in some cases, okay? So the primary band, we use 2.4 and five gigahertz. So 5G, right? We talked a lot about this before, but if you haven't heard about it, 5G is desi designed for high signal, short range, okay? They mean distance. Okay, so if you're far away from it, you're not gonna get much of the signal, but it's used in high signal. Most of our devices operated in 2.4 gigahertz. Okay, now the channel width is in megahertz here. And for 802.11ac, which is the standard that we're using today, that will be five gigahertz band and 2.4, it's 20, 40, 80, and 160. So it's working with all the, the lower channel and dual bands, okay? So you can put some of the things, some of the things that need to go on your 2.4 is your, your smart TV, right? Smart refrigerator, uh, IOT devices, like surveillance camera, um, Let's see what else. Uh, smart garage, smart locks, those should go on a 2.4. Now for things that, you know, like system, uh, gaming system, you can put it on, on 5G at home because that would require higher bandwidth, right? So you can separate them so that way they would be more effective inside your network. So to answer number 14, we have wireless routers that are 802.11ac. It's managed 20, 40, 80, 160 megahertz, and you have dual band 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So I wanna wrap up the rest of these questions before we take a break. So we might go over two o'clock a little bit before, okay? So on the wireless side, I captured this table for you so you can see the differences, right? So AC is what we're using. The older ones are here. We no longer use, in some network they might have N, but 
I think everybody transitioned to AC and AC is backward compatible with N. Um, we don't really have AD or AF. Some of these are, you know, used for testing purposes and AH, but you do see others listed there. Now to pro better protect your wireless network, right? You should change your default SSID, your network name, right? That's what your, your service set identifier. It's always beaconing. It's always sending out like, hey, I am this network. I'm here, connect to me, right? So you can change it. You can disable the broadcast to hide it so that way nobody can discover it. So if you don't have anything else that's going to be added to your network, you can stop it from broadcasting uncheck that option, very easy, okay? Um, and all access point broadcast SSID as plain text. You should change your default password on your wireless router, we all know that, right? But the manufacturer, if you lease your, your wireless router from a service provider, they, you can reset it back, Every, all, all your, even when you buy one, you can reset it. Um, in case you forget it. Um, you should Mac filter and you should control your ports. So enable the ports that you only use, okay? Antenna placement is important because uh, in some cases we don't want the signal to reach a certain area. Hospital is a good example, right? Um, you see that their ER room has a lot of different type of um, systems that would require different radio signal, right? And you don't want interference with those signals. So we can install the access point in specific location and angle the, the antenna a certain way. So we have directional, that can be a single direction and omnidirectional it transmit for 360 degree, all directions. So when you buy wireless um, router from the store or when you receive one from your service provider, likely it uses omnidirectional antenna and then you can also add specific direction antenna. Okay, so I took this, um, you can also use power base antenna, but when you install wireless, like if you think about like, if you have a very large home, okay, think about how you can add access point. So it's overlapping like this, okay? So when we map it out in a network layout, we wanted to install it to where it overlaps. The people that's gonna get to this, they're gonna pick up the signal from the second one. Otherwise, if you don't overlap, you're gonna, you're gonna lose signal in between one and the other, okay? So in this design right here, if I have a person sitting at this desk and this area right here, they're not gonna get signal, okay? So this could be the section that we don't need signal. So we might, have it designed this way. Okay. So here kind of show you on how a business would implement it. You have servers connecting to the switch and then the switch have access points and then those access point would connect the devices. Question? Yes. You can have a, a, a second access point that uh, is connected to first access point that's connected to the cable. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't. You okay. bridge it. You, you, you can. Yeah. So if you have another wireless router sitting around somewhere, you can do that. You can use it to better filter too. So but you know it would create bottleneck if you have a lot of traffic like if your kids are all gaming at once it will slow it down of course they're going to complain so if you filter it in a second access point but yes you can 
you can have it hierarchy, right? So your main wireless router connects to your service provider. Then you take the second wireless router, you plug it into one of the LAN, the ethernet port that it has, configure it to talk to the other one because it still needs to have keys and all of that, just like the other system, right? And then using that now, if you treat it like a repeater, all it is, is just going to repeat the other one SSID and the other one information, or you can make it where it's a sub network where you can separate it. Other people can connect to the main one and then some system will connect to the second one, which connects to the, to the main wireless router. Does that make sense? Oh, I was, I was thinking then of a, of a third access point which connects to the second, uh, which is connected by ethernet cable to the router. Okay. okay, yeah, so you can do that. Okay. So you have a main wireless router and then two of the two children underneath, right? No, it's then, more a uh, one, no, it's hierarchical, so it's not. Oh, okay, so okay. yeah, so top, second, and then the third. Yeah, you can yeah. do that. Okay. And then you can put, you know, the kids on one and then you on the other one, or they can go to the main. People should have options in three, but if you wanted to really screen, you can do it that way. So it screens at the first one, the second one, and the third one. So it's, yeah, it's top down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so that would be one way that you can redesign your wireless network at home. That's a good idea, right? However, you know, going through three filters and three things could be, a, you know, a lot for some users. Okay, disable your guest network if you don't use it. Um, and on the ad hoc side, because you can connect each other without, to each other without access point if you wanted to have a peer-to-peer -peer environment, you can configure it that way. Um, like for example, I, I would connect to the printer or I, and the printer would connect to the wireless network or I can directly connect to the printer without it connecting to the wireless network. So um, that will be more ad hoc and Bluetooth is ad hoc. Um, a lot of the wireless technology is ad hoc. Okay, so here is your protection for, for the wireless. So we should use WPA2 and that's implemented with the AC, also the N, uh, 802.11N. Um, it's a replacement of WPA. WPA is very weak. It would, people can crack it, right? Using N crack or air crack. Um, and even when you see cane enable in cane, it has that capability to crack wireless wireless keys. So WPA2 is better, stronger cryptography, right? It doesn't mean that it's not, it's the safest, right? It's the safest as user. So um, what you see is you should use WPA2, which stands for Wi-Fi Protection Access 2. And, you know, they say that, you know, this is going to continue to be implemented even later on, but they might update some of the things on that cryptography. So some of the other ones, uh, you might see AES being implemented. It replaces TKIP. TKIP is, is um, pretty weak. So when you look at the old wireless router, it uses temporary key integrity. This is an older encryption that used WPA2, so it has weaknesses, okay? The newer one is the CCMP. And that is used with WPA2. So this is a better option. Okay, so if you see two options, right? Pick, pick WPA2 versus WPA. And if you see TKIP, it's weak, use CCMP. Now, most people at home use this pre-share key, your PSK, where you would have that same security key for all your devices. If you use enterprise mode, we saw this in the last class too, for those of you who took it, you have to create user accounts and, and uh, passphrase for each. 
Okay. <clears throat> Enterprise mode, most likely they want to implement some kind of radius server for remote access that will allow the user to authenticate so that way they would connect to other system. So what, what do I mean by remote access, right? Like I would authenticate to MVC network and to be able to access the computer at my desk um, or the servers on their systems, et cetera. And they sometimes call that the triple A server. Okay. So let's answer the next two and take a break. So how should uh, how should we protect your your wireless network? Number one for number fifteen, we should change your SSID default settings or hide it, right? Disable it from broadcasting. Number for the second thing, number sixteen, how should wireless AP antenna be placed? Place where the mobile devices are being used, overlapping antenna signals. So if you have all the kids in the living room, you know, usually watching their tablets or smart TV, then that would be more of your central area. If, and in some cases, like in my situation, I have two cables that comes into my house. One is the living area and then one used to be my office upstairs. So um, I can plug it into two different areas, right? Now, if I remove it from the office upstairs, my husband would have an issue because the signal then, you know, so then we would consider using amplifier. So it depends on the physical location too, right? Where you are often used. So now as I'm sitting here, I'm right below the office upstairs. So I'm able to get full signal. So you would want to consider where you would, where you would place it. And then number 17, the difference between WPA2 and WPA is that WPA is susceptible to brute force or password crack. Could be that uh, dictionary too. Uh, not recommended for cryptography for wireless. WPA2 is a stronger cryptography and it's harder to crack. It just take longer to crack. And the common wireless attacks you're gonna see is your vector attacks, initiation vector, your IV attack, where they can scan your network and capture a packet and look at that packet, the wireless traffic, it's gonna show what is that IV value. They're gonna use that value and they can make a fake packet and use that value to see if they can send it through. So IV attack is common. Evil twin, that means that they make a fake router that looks like your router or your access point at home. They can also use NFC attack where it would read your near field communication signal using radio uh, sensors and such, or they can jam where it, it changes the signal from one system to the other, where it stops the communication. So those are some wireless attacks, IV, evil twin, NFC, and jamming. Okay. Do you have any question for me as far as wireless? Yes. Okay. So, yes. So for the um, password for the routers, um, is there a limit like, or doesn't even like, you know how the standard is to have like a 20 character password because that can't be cracked. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it, does it even make sense to have a password that's 30 characters long? Or does that allow, is that allowed on a router? It depends on how old or new your router. I think some 
I know a lot of the newer routers, it can take up to like 50, 60 characters. Um, but if you have like some somewhat of an older or depending on a manufacturer, yeah, usually you would see like 20 or 30. Um, only because when even after when you brute force, even after eight characters, it get it, it's a lot, it's a lot longer in time to even attempt between like eight to longer. So I I feel like 20 is still gonna buy us a lot of time. And if that's if you don't use dictionary or pre-known keys, right? Um, I see some people typing in some chat. So in my opinion, I really think that like the huge, if, if you're looking at going from 20 to like 30, yeah, that might give you a lot more time. But anything above, you know, 14 or 16 is, it takes a while, even on a powerful system or, you know, they have to use a group of systems to really brute force it. Okay. So if a, then, yeah. if, a, if a student had access to a quantum computer, should, uh, <laughs> <laughs> should I be worried? Uh, well, yeah, on that, pers on that aspect, right? Or they can have like, you know, super powerful systems grouped together and trying to target that one, you know, so let's say like I have like what, 20 gaming system trying to brute force that one system which is, you know, on a regular consumer scale, not, not, not going to be occurring too often, but it could, right? There's always a possibility. Um, then, yeah, I would be in concern. So I was, so I asked something similar to one of the, the person that mainly does this for a living, like, like he would attack wireless network. And I would ask him, you know, does it really make a difference, um, you know, after a certain point, he said, um, yeah, after a certain point, it will be too long. And usually it's not worth it. So for him, he said that after like, you know, 16, 20 characters, it's not really worth it. Unless you use dictionary base or something that's already known and that they can quickly plug it in because it's more on their convenience. So um, yeah, in my opinion, 20 characters is probably decent. And you could use symbol, letters, numbers, and different mixes. Okay. Okay. And then eventually we would have different ways to authenticate to our wireless, hopefully. But yeah. So I think there are only a few quantum systems that are fully functional, right? Like Google has one, NASA has one. Um, and then there are gov our government, of course, but, you know, the ones that are known to the public that's, you know, being shown. I think technology company, they own some of those, so. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna save the last two. We're gonna come back real quick and then finish the last two. And then we're gonna talk about the project. So I'm gonna give you about 15 minutes break. Okay, so at 2.26, 25, we can come back and and finish up the rest and talk about the lab. All right, let's take a break, everybody.
Uh, Professor, uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, I guess it's kind of a, a overall question right now since we're discussing the actual network security. Um, at my home, I have a, um, a, a guest Wi-Fi, or mm -hmm. I kind of have, well, you know, like just these visitors or even everybody else in my family, I kind of have them on the guest network. And I have mm -hmm. my own network that I have my own devices on in, in a, and another, and another network that's not being broadcast. So is that kind of like a, a good architecture, I should say? Yeah, I think um, if you're using the non-broadcast network for maybe work or something that would relate it to what you do, um, that will be good. But essentially it comes back to your Wi-Fi router. So, what I would do is if you want to, um, you know, if somebody really wanted to attack, it's a single point failure, right? Like if they take down your Wi-Fi, if, if assuming that you put it all on that one same load, you know, because that's being serviced by service provider. Um, so if you have essentially another access point for a separate network, it's still funneling through that point. Um, so yeah, I think it's okay. I would, I don't really like using guest uh, network at home that's enabled unless, you know, if, if you have like a small business at home, you're going to have a lot of visitors that's going to come in and actually access the network. The only thing is that because on the guest network, it has minimal um, security feature that's implemented. So you don't really see um, a lot of the activities if you have a lot of users on that end. Um, so yeah, you know, that's really a preference in, in just my opinion. I think guest network is really designed for something that's like temporary, that should be, uh, that should be like, you know, super transparent. Now, you know that anytime that they connect to a network, they can connect to other parts of the network. So <laughs> Um, so if you minimize the way that that attacker funnel in, that would just, you know, enhance your security a little bit. So in my opinion, I think that for the people at home, uh, possibly set up something that's a little bit more secure for them and then disable the, the guest network and you can Mac filter everybody inside your home. Uh, but yes, you should separate the, the stuff that you do like in the case where if I have another contract with an entity that's gonna be, you know, that they want super private stuff, I, some of them, they even don't even like the idea of getting on Zoom because Zoom is not that secure. So they have asked that everything is to be communicated with analog voice, meaning that you actually have to call them. Um, and then, you know, all the traffic, as soon as, you know, when I remote into their network, I usually don't use my main, um, I actually have a hotspot that I use and I just configure that hotspot to filter a lot of the things. So um, that, that would be, yeah, completely separating it would be a good idea. So yeah, I think you're on the right track. I think if you manage the guest network a little bit better, then you can just still maintain it. Okay, yeah, I think, um, yeah, because I, I have a router that is pretty pretty good. That's one of the reasons why I kind of kind of bought it. Um, but I guess I'm thinking about setting up the networks incorrectly. And now that you kind of explained it, like, yeah, it kind of makes more sense to instead uh, use the regular uh, bands. Like, I have a 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz. So I'm thinking of just dedicating the 2.4 to them and then just yeah. leaving the 5 gig for me just to kind of like keep them a little bit separate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I just thought the, I mean, the, the, the guest pass, guest uh, uh, network is still password protected, it's still using WPA2, but right. um, like you said, it's always better to have a little bit quicker. And I'm not that worried about it either, because it's, it's just a home network. So even if somebody comes in, it's like, well, what are you going to get? Or just, it's just a family. Yeah, so, the, the people that's really attacking home networks are usually, you know, the script kitties or sometimes like the the people in the neighborhood that might be curious. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have anything, and even if you have things, if you shut down your systems and, and not, you know, at that time, 
uh, because a lot of times people just leave things running like computer would just be on you know system like printers would just be available and that's how they're able to get in i think uh, uh you know the easiest way to get in is through printers and smart devices because they they have minimal security protection with a lot of the firmware that they release so you don't really you know yeah even if you use that that's how they usually get in is that they can bypass some of the the simpler devices and once they're in the network it's pretty open game it depends even if you if even if you have different section of the network because you can find your way you know just following the breadcrumbs to kind of just look around and 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 see things so um yeah and also like if you you can consider putting up like network attached storage and protecting your network attached storage so that way you know like people at home can use it but you can have it with protection um so a lot of people that implementing the more advanced home network they would have like let's say a usb storage and when you buy like the two to three terabyte it comes with you know the tools where you can configure it and you can make it into like the network attached storage and you can you know have it password protected you can encrypt some portion of it you can do a lot to it where you can better protect your data that's being shared from one device to the, the other. Um, to be honest with you, like um, I read a lot about smart TV and how how they can be very easily, you know, hacked into. But I opted to use it because, you know, with smart devices, we want the convenience. Um, but my refrigerator is Wi-Fi ready and I never connect my refrigerator. It always asks me to, but you know, like I don't really need that. So I'm not going to turn it on my, like the majority of the time, my wireless printer is not functional. Like I only turn it on when I need to print something and rarely that I print anything. Now everything is digital. So um, yeah, so think about how you would set up your access point in a way where you can control some of it. Like Michelle was asking, like, can I put, can I make it where it would communicate with the other? So yeah, you can do that. You can have two at the same level and then one for your family one for you and then the main one is going to connect to those and you can screen through each one so no good uh, thank you i mean uh dad you got me thinking about that because i'm uh, i don't typically like using like cloud storage and like it's like a like you said right now i guess probably probably better to have a network or a nas and it's gonna yeah with that and then and they're so affordable now so yeah i'm still keeping keeping track for like 10 years ago like i wanted to build a nas but it was like so expensive because you had to set up braid and stuff but yeah, yeah. I, i've been behind <laughs> uh but yeah i'm thinking of implementing that now and now that you mentioned with the internet of things typically what it, typically what i do um is uh well i only, I only have a smart tv uh, that they live they use in the living room but um i use the the router I don't know how to call, how to call it, but the, the the management tool that they that they include for the routers, and usually I have it locked away. Like I, I disable the connection, and it alerts me when somebody new connects and stuff like that. So I'm hoping it, it catches people that try to they do it, and unless they're really good and I guess they hide themselves. But I yeah. turn off the smart TV, and is that good enough? It's like if you disable the smart TV and only turn it on when we're gonna watch it, or just it being connected is still vulnerable. Yeah. So uh yeah so that should be the way is that you can turn off the wi-fi option of it for the majority of the time right but um i use streaming completely so i i i just stop paying for regular cable so i have you know so when i turn on the tv i just enable that and then it, it it's because it usually asks me what's the wi-fi option and so forth and then I occasionally change the configuration on the TV, but um, years ago I had a surveillance camera system uh, that was weak and it uses uh, like open DNS and uh, you know, I was, so one day it was not working and I, I guess I didn't really check it, but I came in and I saw that they were uh, running script trying to uh, break my, my passwords for my surveillance camera and oh, wow. in the field it actually has like a bunch of scripts so i took the script and i pull it and i read it you know line by line to see what they were trying to do and um at that point like you know so as soon as that happens i pulled 
all the camera. Like I just, I shut it off and, you know, I pulled the, the open DNS services because that, that um, I use, I used to have Night Owl and, and that was the service that I use and I used to have Frontier. And so they were trying to funnel in that way. And then uh, after that, I reconfigured and I used a completely new, new sets of camera because when I looked into the firmware of their camera, um, you know, because of the service, it 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 had a lot of vulnerability. So now I'm completely on solar on my surveillance system, and then, you know, surveillance camera is a toss. So it's really like you know you kind of weight the risk to use it. So, but I have to use it in my neighborhood. Um, so it's kind of like uh, I'm a little sketchy <laughs> about it, but at the same time I have to use it. So yeah, unfortunately. But I do configure it on, on our wireless router to, to monitor it. But at the same time, like it's only effective as how much I would monitor it. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. All right. So the last part, we're going to talk about the last two. Um, so um, it touches on your authentication protocol encapsulation um, and you know working with the keys so here it talks about EAP um, and some of these tie back to Cisco design so when you see it, like eat fast that's really for Cisco certificate so when you're using Cisco devices you often see like Cisco routers wireless routers some of the smart appliances that they have um, and when you see TLS, like eat tunnels TLS like this, so that would use the, it would establish like what I would describe as an analogy with the lockbox with the tunnel. So in the later devices, what you see is the authentication method that we implemented require different cryptography and how that would be encrypted for the authentication session, because the easiest way to really access the network is to get the credential, right? Um, I, I would not go about trying to, you know, reverse engineer a key. I would try to fish out for, you know, the user to give me that key or capture the session so I can capture the key as in many of these use the same key to lock or to unlock. So what we have is we would, require more remote access and different ways to authenticate. So here it shows you different types of um, authentication protocol that's being implemented. Um, I move away from single sign-on and I think many organization has done that too. Single sign-on means what? Like I can sign on to the network using my username and password and it will pass that credential to different types of servers, right? Like email servers, could be Canvas, et cetera. Um, it is convenient for the user that they don't have to remember all their passwords, but the downside of this is that same credential can, can be used and can be manipulated. Um, so I think SSO is not as a popular solution. And I would only implement it on a very simplest level where you don't have essential data sitting around. Um, so that way the users would, would be able to access, but at the same time, um, you know, you kind of have to weight the risks on that. So RCCD used to have a lot of single sign-on and now they transition to kind of phasing it out, but they still use it in a certain extent. Um, so that's a risk and security that we want to, get to, to look at and revisit um, as we deploy the solutions, okay? Captive portals is a way that we would use a web browser, right, to process access to the network. And you do see this a lot with the wireless side is that they would have, like, let's say you go to a hotel, um, and you would log into, let's say Hilton, right? And they would give you a site and you would use your membership information to access it. And with that, they would give you wireless access and so forth. Um, so it's a way that they can monitor specific processes on their network. Um, 
now many companies would use captive portals for different things from purchasing to you know shipping to different things for their operations um, however with that they have to implement it with the web server authentication server and other areas um, and all of all of the security solutions really comes down to how complex do you want to administer your network um, because convenience might seem easy right but and it reduces the administration part and to me that's just simply lazy <laughs> so um, they never like it when I talk to the security people when I do consulting is because I call them out like I would say that you know you simply do this is because it's easy for you but then you know, if if we wait it out to the dollars, we might be losing more money in the long run. So the decision maker, when they step in and they say, that, okay, so if we put in, you know, more administration and pay for that, what is the return on investment in that, right? Okay. So here it talks a little bit about each of the type of attacks. So you can take a look at how jamming is done that is like just degrading the performance of the signal. It saturated the signal. They can use an actual hardware to do it. Um, so, and to prevent some of these attacks, we kind of have to know of them. Um, and so that way we will prepare ourselves to have the solution for them. Evil Twin, you can use something like a Wi-Fi pineapple for that. Um, IV attack, it, it would start with like a Wireshark scan so they would sniff and then uh, they would use different tool like cola to to do packet injection so it would take a packet it would reconstruct the packet and then you can add in details in the packet so there are software tools that you can do that as well um, for the iv attack initiation initiate initialization vector attack okay so on page 13, you can see more of the attacks. And then for the Bluetooth, we got blue jacking, blue snarfing, blue jugging, okay? So blue jacking is sending unsolicited messages with the near Bluetooth devices. We don't see this common yet, but I think you know down the line as we have more Bluetooth devices being used for different things outside of just like, you know, um, AV, okay, audio visuals, we would see more of that for marketing reasons. Blue snarfing is, um, it allows an entity that's unauthorized to access your contact list, your email, etc. And this is how you can impersonate someone um, and hack into their email and such because, so Bluetooth, if you don't use it, turn it off, okay? Because Bluetooth is very easy to break. So, um, and they improve different versions, even with version 5.X, right? Like they're at 5.1, 5.2 now. Um, it's still at risk, of course. Blue jugging is installing a back door so that way they can eavesdrop um, and this would tie back to the physical because Bluetooth range is very short, okay? And you guys know the story about the Bluetooth, right? It's named after the Viking king that has blue teeth. <laughs> so uh, so you can read more into the history behind that. So Question? Yes. So what does that mean if uh, I have a this cheap Android phone. And I, I always turn my Bluetooth off, but once in a while I'll see that it's turned on and I didn't do that. What's, what's going on there? So it could be an app that's doing that, or it could be some kind of services that's trying to activate it or something that could be circumventing your system. Um, somebody is controlling your system maybe, but a lot of the times it's software oriented because, uh, you know, depending on the versions of the Android. So I, I rarely hear about those. So when things get turned on like that, it's usually through software, you know, that they had instructions for it to initialize. 
if that's not the case, you, you can check your app permissions and see if it's accessing Bluetooth. All the all the blue, the app that has accessing Bluetooth, it usually requests for that. Um, and so when you look at the certificate, and possibly it could be that you know Bluetooth. Yes, you can remotely control that from another device. So check your. Um, yeah. So yeah, I what I, I would. Oh, yes. Go sorry, ahead. I, I would suggest reporting it to Google. Look at the versions of the Android you're running. If you haven't pushed updates, push the updates. But I would I would check to see if on Google to see if they have issues with that, or it could be the firmware for that particular manufacturer. So if it's like Samsung or you know TSE, one of those company, they it, it could be coming back to the firmware because Bluetooth is a chip that's that's in, in, incorporated onto that board, and if you know with the software level, the OS sometimes it sends instructions for that chips to be receiving signal. That's why it's seeing it on that end. But I I really think it's the version of the Android or some kind of software that's doing that your app possibly. What was your question? That's it. Okay. So let's talk about um, the VPNs. Okay. So here are some of the general VPNs that I want to share with you. So direct access VPN is a server role. So you would have a server that would, you know, and that would tie in with remote access servers, your AAA servers, which is for with for authentication to be um, remotely accessing a certain system. You can have a VPN concentrator that's just gonna be dedicated device that's gonna be used for VPNs only. Okay, and that would be a better approach. IPSEC, we touched on it earlier. So when you use the VPN concentrator, you should use the militarized zone um, because that could be the traffic is coming from outside of your network through the web. And we want to implement strong encryption and authentication protocols that would be adequate to make sure that you service that. Anything that's public, that's web, you gotta expect some kind of attack. So, um, using the, the technology, we have to have an expectation and implement the secure solution. So IPSEC, we touch on this. So it uses the, uh, the authentication header. So it requires that. So before, before it could exchange data, it actually authenticate the entity and then exchange the data. And it uses encapsulated security payload. TLS is used for open VPN or open connect. This uses H HTTPS, okay? So when you get these services for online that you pay $10 a month or you know $100 a year for VPN, you're actually using TLS-based VPN, okay? Um, and your, con your connection is only as safe as how they manage it. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then there's different type of tunneling for VPN. Um, many companies, they would do a site-to-site -site VPN, meaning that I can have one branch with the corporate office that would be, uh, you know, connecting for the users on that VPN. So you can have it across the networks, okay? And then we have always on VPN. This is always on and it can be used to incorporate it with site to site or remote access, okay? So sometime companies would use site to site to transfer, you know, or sync data, um, stuff like that, okay? So for the next question in this, um, you can just identify, you can list any of those. So I chose to use IPSEC, right? Uh, direct VPN, and you can also list site to site. 
And the ones that we commonly seen for consumer is the TLS with port 443. So when you install the, the VPN, you know, you, when you configure the VPN, you have to enable this port if you're using TLS and then also on the device, on that network, the network devices, you want to make sure that you route it for that type of traffic. Okay. Because VPN is used to do what to connect to a certain system safely, right? I can connect to my system at work. I can connect to a certain server system if I'm an administrator or even a user. So now firewall is usually also needs to be configured for these VPNs, right? And so that way, when we bring in the traffic, we wanted to also filter it. So this is why on the administration end, when you work with VPN, you have to configure the network appliances, the security appliances to accommodate that. Um, and lastly, for your network access control. So network access control really means two things, right? Monitoring and inspection. So we can run the, a lot of these appliances and the software tool that we use, it would give us the, the network monitoring capability. And then we just need to check and inspect the logs. So on for the security analysts, logs is what they read, right? And you know some are better at reporting and giving you the statistic. Um, you know, nothing glamorized about the job, but the job pays really, really well. So if you have like, you know, if you like that kind of task, that could be useful. Sorry, my dog's acting up right now. They're just misbehaving. Shh. Sorry, I kind of had to step in correct them real quick because they're just fighting about a toy. Okay. Uh, for the identity and access services, uh, that comes back to really the control for security. So when you're using uh, PAP, it's password-based authentication, or you can use Challenge Handshake, which is CHAP is very commonly used in Microsoft. TAKEX is often used with uh, radius servers or in um, terminal based access like if you ever go to airport train um, or companies that use terminal systems right you you often see that they would have this and they would tie it with you know access tokens or you know smart cards stuff like that for their employees um, and so there will be a lot more to discuss in the area of security for these sub areas because access control is really a gateway to either better protection or the lack of protection. Okay. Any questions regarding? So for number 20, right? What is the purpose of network access control is to really have continue continuous monitoring and to make sure that we inspect our system access. Okay. Okay. So that would conclude the week three assignments. If you miss anything from the prior weeks, make sure you submit it on Canvas so I can update your grade, right? I'm fairly lenient with late assignments, so I will take it. And all you need to do is fulfill a lot of the tasks just to get a good grade so you can complete the course with the credit, uh, with the non-credit course. Okay. So next I'm gonna to touch on your project. And um, I really thought about what can I implement to kind of introduce you to some resources that you can possibly use for yourself or for business. Um, and firewall itself can be a course because there's so many different types of firewall and how we can configure the firewall to protect the network. So I, what I did was I used an emulator 
again so that way you can use your browser to check it out okay instead of downloading a tool so for a firewall the definition for a firewall is it could be either software or hardware most of the time in an enterprise level we would use a box right a hardware and we would filter the traffic block outsiders um, and then to be able to monitor the traffic through the firewall. So it gives us some level of protection and we can't rely completely on the firewall. So in this, um, in this particular project, I want to introduce Sonic Wall, okay? And Sonic Wall is, they've been around for a long time. Uh, so the link that I provided for you, this is the series for small business, small to medium sized business, your SMB and branch base. So it's on a small scale. You will find other products that are on a larger scale. Now, um, you can see the other series. Some of them would require the username and password and it would give you the message for that. They look a little bit different as far as interface goes. So for the TZ series, I want you to choose TZ600, right? Once you select that, you can click view demo. And what they did was they took an actual live capture of the firewall and it tells you when they did it. So this is a snapshot of what that would look like when you're using the tool, right? The, when you use the software side of it. So this was taken two days ago and it's real traffic. So what I want you to do is take a look at that, take a look at the information. So it tells you the bandwidth for that and then the type of connections or the amount of connections. Now on this one, they didn't capture the, the encrypted traffic. So they didn't generate any encrypted traffic, I should say. So you didn't see anything there. Likely that on a firewall, you're gonna see unknown users. So its job is to really block things that are outside, right? So on this, on this capture, they show you that there's 61% unknown users. <clears throat> <clears throat> and the throughput on, on, on the traffic, the speed that it screens is this speed, while our bandwidth is this, okay? Now, um, when you put the firewall and you when you deploy it and when it's live, what you would see is you're gonna see the threat changes, okay, constantly. So especially when you when you hosting websites and and you providing services to other entity, so you would see like this value change. So on this capture, it doesn't really show us like this, you know, too many traffic. It's only to the specific, but realistically, when you see this in real life, it's going to be a lot. So when you work with this project. I want you to view the demo, which shows you the interface of what that firewall looks like. Um, put down the model, right? And if you wanted to check out the other model, you're welcome to. They have it's a little bit different as far as the interface. Uh, write down the answers for the bandwidth, right? The throughput and the percentage of the unknown users. So when you're looking at the firewall, it's essential that we take a look at the summary of it, right, first. And on the left here, it actually tells you the specific monitor and the status. We can even investigate specific areas of it, okay, which is later. And then you can, over, you can look at the overall threat. So I simply just want you to look at that, answer the questions, and it didn't have any kind of prevention threat there. So I see some chat question maybe. <laughs> yeah, my dogs are they're kind of rowdy and people are fearful of them, but 
they are also very sweet sometimes, most of the times. Okay. All right. So um, check out the inspection of the threads, the type of filter that's enabled on the appliance. So when you look at the appliance, we wanted to look at the type of filter, right? So what do I mean by the type of filter? GOIP filter. That means that it's going to be you know, filtering by IP, botnet filter, um, content filtering. So we can even, why do they do that, right? So content could be keyword based. Um, things like if we wanna block internal traffic from sending out emails that would be having social security number, uh, private data from our customer, stuff like that, it should also be able to inspect. It can inspect content that would be, you know, distribution of child pornography. You never know because sometimes you have insider threats. There could be a vast amount of things that we can look at, right? Um, so put down the type of filter that you would be seeing, okay? Now, a good firewall is gonna give you the ranking and your risk. Okay, <clears throat> and the higher the number usually means the higher the risk. Most company would address the stuff in the red, like level five, level four first. So as security professional, we focus on the level of ranking risk and the high risk we wanted to mitigate as, as soon as possible. So here it shows you the riskiest applications, right? We do see a BitTorrent happening there, some Facebook there, some Evernote there. Okay. And then on the right, it talks, it shows like the applications that use the most storage. Okay. Now, when we start drilling down with the investigation, so we can pull this up. And we can say, okay, it categorizes us for the type of traffic, right? It tells you the source, the destination, and the protocol being used. So all network appliances would do that. It would tell you the category, the priority, right? Sometimes this will be in number, and then a lot of times it will tell you what type that is. Uh, <clears throat> and then the message. So it's looking at the packets and it's going to show you the details. So now if I investigate, I wanted to go down and look at something that would be warning, right? And you can also categorize it by clicking this and it would categorize it for you. So if I click the category or the priority, I can, I can group them together and take a look at it, okay? So let's say that I have a warning, this one, ICMP, that's a ping. So they have a policy to drop the ping, okay? So ICMP packet drop due to policy. So it shows that. So there's a rule that's set on the firewall that blocks ping, okay? Which, where is that coming from? Here's the source, here's the destination, and there's the protocol, okay? Sometimes there would tell, it would tell you additional information in the notes. So this is how you would look at an incident on a firewall, okay? And I'm trying to convey it at the simplest level so you can see, right? Um, but in a regular security class, when we're on campus, I usually have the student set up the device and, and take a look at it uh, and set up the rules. So, okay, so what I want you to do is to look at the warning message, tell me the source and the destination. And from a perspective of a professional, we wanted to look at that, monitor that and see if that's something we need to address right away. Okay, so after looking at the sonic wall, you can close. Now, there are many companies that produce different types of firewall from Cisco to Sonic to WatchGuard, so many, 
okay? Barracuda. So it's really the option in for how the, the network architect and the security architect really wanted to implement this if you're building the network from scratch or if you're implementing security solutions. Okay, the second part of this project is for you to find a firewall. And I want it for a small business or even on, let's say if you do home business or if you have important things you wanted to protect. And this budget is fairly lean because you're gonna find that firewalls is fairly affordable on a small scale. So all you have to do is open up your browser and you can type in firewall systems, right? You can do shopping if you want. I don't want a software firewall, okay? Because software, we can get that through our security suite. We know that. So you can find the type of firewall. So sometime you would see that it would be Soho like this, like the Sonic wall, right? Uh, watch guard. Firebox, so you can visit their website and look at the features. My personal opinion and experience with WatchGuard, I did not like how their interface is. Um, and I haven't used WatchGuard for a few years now, only because I found that there's a lot of issues with their firmware. Um, but that was just my previous experience. They might have improved it over time, okay? So you can find the type of firewall. And of course, you can look at Cisco, you can look at others and they can go up to quite a bit. Okay, so let's pull it up from shopping. Juniper is also a common brand, right? This is an old one. This is what I use for security class, the so ASA 5501. It's an all-in-one security appliance for small business. Um, they had release new ones. So if you want like great practice, you can, you can buy a system like this, very cheap, $80, $100 or less, and you can learn how to configure it and be better at it. And then once you have that, put that on your resume because Cisco is specific to its model, right? So you would have to use the terminal to configure it. Um, so that's the best way to practice, you know, using firewall is to get an actual appliance and then be able to, to use it. Um, firewall is kind of new, they're in the market now, but as you can see, Sonic wall is pretty dominant too, right? On the small scale and a large scale level. And then you got Cisco Picks, you got, you know, different ones there. Fortrinet, they're pretty good too. They have their own software version for security suites. And then they also have, you know, cloud protection and other services. So, um, so you can pick the one that you want to use. Okay. And see, like on this one, it's about, Two three thousand dollars. So this would be, you know, the minimum for the business use. Okay. So find one that you like to use. Provide the description of it, and then explain to me why you selected it. Okay, it could be some of the features that would stand out for you, right? Like something that you would consider buying if you have, you know, a few hundred dollars laying around and you wanted to add the firewall to your network outside of your wireless router screens filter. Okay, any question as far as the project? This is due next Saturday. So if you want to, uh, you know, work on it this week, but in case if it's late, I will open some of the assignments until the 17th. Okay, any question as far as the project goes? Again, right? Any missing assignments need to be submitted on Canvas so I can grade it um, because if it's not on Canvas, I don't have a, you know, even if you send it an email, 
right? They want everything to be on Canvas. So please send it, submit it on Canvas. So click assignment, click submit and attach it. Okay, let's talk about the lab and then I'll give you time for the lab. So password cracking can be very fun, right? You saw I, I did a small little demo for you, but you gotta you get to do it in the lab. So we're gonna use practice lab. And I saw that they had pulled a lot of the Kali Linux, possibly because we complained that it's kind of slow. So I was looking at some of the labs for you to use, but they had pulled a lot of the activities that's Kali Linux space. So I thought this one will be fun and interesting for you. So to start, make sure that you click the button that I had attached for the lab. And then it's gonna route you here. Make sure that we disable the um, pop-up blocker or we, in, we allow pop-up for practice lab. So it's gonna pop up the virtual machine. This is the BDC01, okay? Now for the lab itself, on the first page, it tells you that you're gonna use BDC01, the, the DM01 and the Windows 7, okay? So where do I turn that on? I would turn it on here. Right, I just simply click the virtual machine to turn it on. And I think they say seven, but I think they meant Windows 10, but let me see. So on the, on the lab, the, the PDDM01, this is the Hyper-V manager. It's a, it's a server that service virtualization for practice lab environment. So this is why you have to turn it on. So follow the steps. These steps basically shows you how you can turn on your Windows 7. Oh, I forgot it's a virtual machine that's inside that. So let me demo it real quick so that way you can see what that will look like. Okay. So the first thing you're gonna see is the server manager. And, and if you didn't do practice lab in the prior classes, right? You've probably seen this before, but this, this server, right? You can see that it's a web server, right? This one, they also use it for uh, DNS, DHCP, Active Directory and WDS. So that way they, they would do it as a backup. So what you would have is you also have it as the a file storage server. So um, in the instructions, it tells you that you need to, okay, click on this, the, the DM01, click the start Hyper-V manager, okay? So you need to open up the Hyper-V manager. So when you see that pop up, it doesn't include the Hyper-V. Okay, so I click the Windows button. Okay, and then I need to access the Hyper-V. And you can also search for it too. So for your server's administration, that will be here. Oh, I'm on a BDC01, what am I thinking? So you have to use this on the DM, which is this one. So turn that on. Okay, so once, once you have it in Hyper-V, you're gonna start Windows 7. Uh, keep in mind that sometimes it does get a little slow. So just make sure that you know we use accordingly. And then the password is gonna be with a zero instead of an O. Okay, so let's connect this. And you can click the connection button here to connect the device, okay? Now, as everybody gets on it, sometimes it does get bogged down. So here's your, here's the second server, right? The DM01, so you click the, the start. And then what you simply do is you can search for, let me see, 
Let me open up the server manager and see. Oh, here's the Hyper-V. So in the server manager, you would see Hyper-V. This is a server role that it has, okay? And so in with the Hyper-V, what you will do is you are going to activate the virtual machine for Windows 7, okay? Let's see, because sometimes they have. Here's the Hyper V Manager. And then there's your Windows 7. It has off right now, so just right click and then choose start. Okay. So once you start it, right, make sure that it starts then what you will do is you are gonna, and it tells you right here, right? You start the Windows 7 in the DM01, okay? And then it's gonna, so, uh, then you're gonna log into Windows 7. Now they already installed uh, Kane so, and some of the tools that you have. So once you log in, you should be able to access those tools. Those tools. So you just download Kane from their Internet Explorer, which is their intranet. Okay. So there is your Windows 7 that will be activated. So once you turn that on, you can use it. Okay. So the lab is going to walk you through how to use Kane. And when you use Kane, right, um, as we touched on last week, after you download and install and run Kane, <clears throat> and you can find this also down, you can download it from the web if you wanted to test it on your home system or on your virtual machine. Installation is pretty straightforward. It uses a WinCap 4.1.3. So if you use it on your regular home computer, I would update it to the newer WinCap. This allows you to sniff out traffic using Kane as well. Okay, one second, my dog wants to now exit the house. So um, after you install WinCap, it should be ready to go. And Kane has the capability to sniff then you are going to <clears throat> use it for breaking or the password. You're gonna crack the passwords, okay? So in Kane, you're gonna use the cracker feature like what I showed you last week. And then you are going to break the LM and the NTLM hashes. So for Windows systems, you would use these hashes, okay? Now, if you are, if you want to do the dictionary attacking cane, you can import in the dictionary list and then be able to use it with the dictionary. So it tells you to click the plus sign, which is in blue. And then once you click the plus sign, you can add in the hashes. So what it does is it pulls the hashes that's stored in, in that system and then it's going to evaluate the hash. OK, so it's going to give you all the accounts that's in that system. So the way we use King for this is to, to really look at you know, how strong or weak the password would be. OK, so if you have a Windows PC at home and you, you wanted to know if your kids are using effective password, right, um, or family members that do that, you can also use this to check. OK. So these are like the same steps that I illustrated last time. So you're gonna brute force it. And then it's gonna to try to guess it and it's gonna plug it in once it finds it. So it's gonna it's gonna enumerate through all the password options, all the characters, and depending on the password, sometime would take longer or shorter time. 
So after we had, let me see if there's questions. Yeah, so remove each one. I it's gonna see a threat, and when you when you use cane, you have to disable the firewall options on Windows. So you have to turn off Windows and firewall, and you have to turn off. Um, you have to to turn off your security software. It's gonna block it because it sees it as threat. I advise for you to use it on a virtual machine so you can use a uh, virtual box or VMware player, workstation player to make your virtual machine. All you need is the operating system ISO, like Windows 10, Windows 7. Kane is supportive of 64-bit as well, okay? So yes, your security software is gonna block it because it sees it as threat. When I use these tools, I always use it on my virtual machine right? But how can you test your home system? Like I said, if you're using, if you're using like Windows 10 with your family members, you can also create an image of it and then roll it into a virtual machine. It's a long way of doing it. So you can analyze that system. Um, but if you do use Kane on your home computer, keep in mind that your security software is going to block it. And also it's going to try to block the website that you're downloading it from. Um, just side note real quick, since Michelle asked, when you're searching for Kane and Abel, it's going to serve you a lot of different sites. Okay. Let's say download. Ten. Okay. So um, there are different websites that I had downloaded um, on my virtual machine using Q QP download um, and also soft radar, radar. So you can find some of those website. Um, and then while the other ones, it wants you to download additional tool in order to, to get the files. They used to have their own website to be able to release it, but they took it down recently. So it's been releasing from you know, third-party websites, okay? So you do see, so I had more successful downloading from these. And yes, I disable my, my security tools when I download it on my virtual machine. So using a virtual machine, right? Use the, the browser on it and then so that way you can download. Okay, so the first portion of this is gonna be for Kane and then um, then next, you're gonna use um, the you're gonna use the dump seven. So here, that's gonna allow you to recover the hashes from the system or even the remote system, some some a system that's connecting to yours. Okay, so it walks you through the steps on how to use AVG. Okay, which some of you have chosen to use AVG at home. Configure the settings. So you have to disable the security tools, otherwise it doesn't work, okay? Like what Michelle was asking earlier. So a lot of these security tool will be blocked, okay? So the beginning steps, it walks you through on how to change the configuration on the AVG on the virtual machine. And then you are going to change the directory to dump seven, okay? And using command line, then you're gonna run the application. As you know that a lot of these tools also are written just for command console base, so when once you change to that directory, you will be able to run dump seven. And then we are gonna use a text file that contains password information. Okay, that's on C drive. And then for, you can look at the content of that file using notepad. 
because any text file you just use a note editor or a text editor to be able to see that so it walks you through that okay then uh go back to cane and then you are going to brute force it okay and it's gonna still keep running because it does take a little bit you can clear everything by remove all and start all over again with new ones so it asks you here do you want to delete it yes yeah, so you clear everything out it's blank again then you're going to add to the list so you're going to do an add list on step 20 here on page two what that does is you're going to add the additional nt hashes okay so we're going to import it from the text file, which is the password.txt that we had. OK. So what we did there was we dump it to the text file. We take that text file and then import it into Kane. So that way Kane can use that list to crack additional passwords. OK. So that's what you can also do is to import in, you know, known hashes to be able to break it. So the process will be shorter. Okay. So it walks you through those. And then it tells you to use the predefined characters. So the way that the password is stored is that it's, you know, as it's it stored as an encrypted file it has to create a hash for it. And the way that we can use it is we would break the hash to be able to, to get your class password in plain, plain text. Okay. So it will tell you how long that would take to crack using you know, the type of systems. Um, and then, let me see. So then you would use the policy management tool on the server. And then you would change the password policy to make it better with the security. So they have you go into security options. So this part walks you through on how to configure Windows security to make sure that it doesn't store the land manager hash so that way it can't be cracked, okay? So once you implement that policy, it improves the security for that system. Okay, uh, let me see what else do I wanna point out as we come down to. So finishing setting that up, then you're gonna try to generate the hash back on Kane again, okay? So after we put in the rules to see if that rules is effective. Um, on the last part, we're gonna use a different tool. So it introduced you to top tool, okay? And this is what we can use to calculate the hash for the password, okay? So um, from a forensic side, we also use this type of tool to look at hashes for different files, also even in the password where we have to recover the password to be able to decrypt some of the things that the user has stored on that image. So you, you know, knowing this process is, you know, outside of just testing password is important because it works with hash and, and how you can use that for different reasons. Okay. Um, and then it shows you how to use rootkit. Okay. Like detecting rootkit. So again, you're going to use the Hyper-V, the Windows 7, you're going to download. Uh, let's see, you're gonna download the tools so and run the executable. Okay, 
And threat fire is going to run. And threat fire can be used to do root kit. Now, your security tools at home does have a root kit detection. And it is only as good as its definition that's stored or you know signature that's stored for that security tools. So here it shows you on how you can be able to detect that. Now, rootkit is used for you know various reasons. Like it would, it can write to RAM. It can do a lot of the damage. It can destroy a system if needs be. Right, depending on the type of rootkit. So, overall, this activity gives you the perspective on how to use better password. How easy password can be cracked. Um, how you can disable the LM hashes because it's pretty weak. Um, and then how to be able to detect and combat against more on the detection with the rootkit. So at the end, make sure we do the assessment. Okay. And then when you're done, make sure you click the done button. Okay. So I hope that you will learn a lot from just using this lab. I know practice lab, sometimes it can be very slow but we wanted to make sure that you have some kind of hands-on in these type of classes. Any question? So no question. So I'm gonna let you do your lab. Don't forget to do the project, complete and submit your assignments. Any late work needs to be turned in. I know most of you are up to date. Your grade should be up to date as of today, okay? Um, next week, I will update additional assignments that submitted. So next week will be our last session on, you know, for this class. And if you complete all three, you will receive a non-credit certificate with the three classes. If you miss any, you can look for these classes possibly in summer or next fall. Um, if any changes, I'll let you know as far as the schedule. Okay. So if you're looking to do security classes, um, I'm teaching CIS 27, the extended version of this class online next semester in spring. Um, and then I had given one of my security class to somebody else, but um, I will let you know if you wanted to learn Python, I'm also teaching Python in the winter. All right, have a good weekend. Work on your lab. Please send an email if you have any questions, okay? All right, take care, everybody. Type in your name in the chat, Juan just started. Thank you interpreters, have a good weekend. See y'all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll stay on for a couple more minutes. Bye, teacher. Have a good weekend. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.
Do you have any questions? Or are you okay? Okay, so bye, Jessica and Joseph. Have a good weekend. I'll see you next week, okay? Take care.